My name is Lieutenant Commander Jerry Darren. Uh, my call sign was JD, which is pretty boring, just my initials. Uh, I did have a few other call signs along the way, but uh, those are classified. Uh, I had the opportunity to fly and serve as a Naval officer and Naval aviator for 13 years. And nine of those 13 years were flying uh, variants of the FA-18 Hornet. Uh, I flew the, the A through uh, D models, which is the Legacy Hornet, and then I also have about 100 hours uh, in the ENF uh, models, which is the Super Hornet, the successor to the Legacy Hornet. Um, total of about 2,000 hours flying Hornets, uh, 325 or so carrier arrested landings. And uh, the last three years of my active duty time, I had the honor and privilege of flying blue jets as both left wingman and slot pilot for the, uh, the United States Navy Blue Angels. So today we're going to take a little walk around, uh, take a look at the blue jet. I'll talk a little bit about uh, mission capabilities and some of the systems. I'll also try to point out some of the unique uh, aspects of the blue jets and some of the modifications. And then some of the, um, some of the tools that we used as Blue Angel pilots to affect uh, a really impressive air show. So um, we'll start uh, here behind this panel. I won't open it up. It's not too exciting. It's just um, it's a series primarily of circuit breakers. Uh, the only time I really used this was if I was on a cross country before I left it uh, at, a, at an airport or a base. I'd always pop this open, pull the canopy circuit breaker so no one could come in and, and uh, get inside the airplane. Um, Let's talk about the landing gear for a little bit right now. Again, this is a Navy and Marine Corps airplane, and uh, as such, is designed for carrier operations. So if you compare this sort of side to side with an F-16, an F-15, an F-22, the first thing that probably is gonna jump out at you is the landing gear. This is big, beefy landing gear, okay? I mean, this thing, look at the size of this strut and, and this trailing support, it's massive. Uh, if you compared this again to say an F-15 or 16, their strut would probably be about the same diameter as this launch bar. So, and the reason that is, is you know, you're coming in at max carrier approach weight of 34,000 pounds, your approach speed is 141 knots. And so your closure is pretty significant and your rate of descent is about 700 to 750 feet per minute on descent. It is a controlled crash, okay? There is no flaring. Right? There is no flaring. And so the amount of pressure and stress that this gear, not only the nose gear, but the main, main mounts have to take is, uh, is significant. So it adds a lot of weight, it adds a lot of heft to the airplane, but it's a prerequisite for carrier operations. If an F-16 tried to land an aircraft carrier, the gear would probably just shoot right up through the wings and it'd be done. So, so let's talk a little bit about carrier operations for the launch. Um, one of the most critical components is this piece of gear called the launch bar. So that's controlled inside the cockpit by a switch. And once uh, the aircraft is positioned uh, following the, the taxi director's signals, um, they will give you a signal. This is the signal and that means extend the launch bar. So you reach down, extend that. They'll have you taxi up a little bit further and then it just drops down into what's called the shuttle. The shuttle is connected to the steam catapult and that's your primary source of propulsion to go from zero to anywhere from 160 to 180 knots in about two seconds. So it is an e-ticket ride. It is the greatest thrill of a lifetime um, and it never gets old. Nighttime's a little different because you're getting catapulted into the abyss. It's like jumping into a, a black bowl of ink, but uh, daytime cat shots are the bomb. They're the best. Uh, so this is the launch bar, really critical component to, to carrier operations. This is also critical. This is the angle of attack indicators uh, or lights. And it's used externally for the landing signals officers, which is a group of pilots that are stationed on the port side uh, of the aircraft. They're in, in uh, of the aircraft carrier. They're in communication with the pilot. Most of the time, nothing is ever said. It's called zip lip. Most uh, aircraft operations around the ship are done without anyone saying it, a single word during the daytime. Nighttime's a little bit different. So the LSOs who are stationed on the port side of the ship uh, have the ability to see these lights. And this gives the LSO is an indication of whether or not the airplane and the pilot are flying an on-speed approach. So Navy pilots fly on-speed angle of attack uh, as opposed to indicated airspeed. And the reason that is, is in the F-18, 8.1 degrees angle of attack is, is the optimum. It gives you two advantages. Number one, uh, at that airspeed, at angle 8.1 degrees angle of attack, you're, you're in an optimal uh, airspeed regime for control. You're not so slow that you're close to stalling, but you're not so f flat and fast that the hook has a good uh, chance of skipping the arresting gear. So 8.1 is the, is the optimum angle of attack. 
So if the, if the uh, airplane and the pilot are flying at optimum AOA, this center light, this amber light is going to be lit up. And the pilot has the same series of lights just to the left of his periphery. So as he's flying and scanning the lineup and scanning the meatball, which pro provides glide slope information, out of the corner of his eye, he wants to see that constant amber light. If he sees a flicker of green, he knows he's getting a little slow. If he sees a little flicker of red, he's getting a little bit, of fa little bit fast. So that information is, is critical for the LSOs as they're judging his approach, both his, his glide slope, his, uh, his lineup on center line, uh, as well as his optimum angle of attack. So once in a while, you know, you get a little too slow, you get a flash of green. If you don't fix it right away, LSOs are probably gonna come up and give you a little power call just, just to help you, hey, you're getting a little slow. Uh, the Hornet is great though. It's super stable, great at capturing 8.1 degrees alpha. Um, you can actually cheat a little bit on that because you can pull up a maintenance sub page on the multi-function displays and you can, uh, it's, it's really not designed for this, but once you pull up the right page, you can set your trim to 3250 is the magic number, hands off, and it's gonna perfectly capture 8.1 degrees alpha. So it's, uh, it's really pretty easy in the Hornet to maintain on speed AOA, all right? Uh, you know, again, big beefy gear, you've got two, two nose, uh, nose mounts. Max tire speed here is 190 knots. Typically won't see that in carrier operations if you're doing training up in you know, Fallon, Nevada, high, hot summer day, big uh, loadout of, uh, of maybe Mark 84s. Uh, you might be seeing 185 uh, at nose wheel liftoff. So you get pretty close to 190 in the right conditions, but uh, 190 here, 210 on the main mounts. All right, moving around. Uh, this is the canopy door, canopy access. So up and down. Um, you know, real nice for if you're on a cross country and you just need to have access to the canopy. Uh, most of the time the crew chiefs are handling this. ECM uh, antennas, uh, you've got uh, pitot static here. Obviously that's um, got pitot heat as well. Here's your angle of attack indicator, UHF antenna. Uh, more UHF, or sorry, more ECM antennas. I overshot the, uh, the gun access door. Uh, we're not going to open it up right now. In, in the Blue Jets, the gun is actually removed uh, and it's replaced with a smoke tank. So it's filled with linseed oil, which is uh, biodegradable. And then that pumps into the exhaust. We'll take a look at that here in a little bit. And that's what creates that nice plume uh, of smoke during the air show. Has no tactical reason at all. It's just for, uh, for show. Um, and that's activated inside the cockpit. I'll show you that a little bit later um, with using the chaff flare switch. So uh, it's replaced to, uh, to, to make the smoke come out the back end. So that's the gun, uh, the gun bay. We'll talk a little bit more about the gun in a second. All right, moving around. Uh, this is really important. Right here, this screw holds the entire airplane together. Take that thing out, it's history. Obviously not. Um, okay, you can see the, uh, the cannon there, the Vulcan cannon. Uh, holds 578 rounds of 20 mic mic. It can be shot in both low mode and high mode, and that's selectable in the, in the cockpit. Uh, low mode, 4,000 rounds per minute. Uh, high mode, 6,000 rounds per minute. Typically in an air to ground mission, you'll use the, the low mode. In air to air uh, missions, typically high mode, 6,000 rounds per minute. So do the math on that. You, you, know, you really only get uh, five or six seconds of trigger squeeze. But when you're, when you're throwing 6,000 rounds a minute downrange, doesn't take too long to tear up a wing or uh, take someone out. So housed inside the, uh, the nose cone is the, uh, the radar, the APG-65. Later versions were the APG-73, slightly improved, slight improvement over the 65. Um, terrific radar. The F-18 was designed from the ground up to be a multi-mission, both fighter and attack. And the radar does a terrific job of supporting all those missions. Air-to-air, uh, -air, uh, it's phase array radar. Uh, it's great at detecting long, long range threats. Uh, it can support a variety of, of missiles, air to air missiles that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we talked about the gun earlier. Um, the air to ground mode of the gun is, is incredibly accurate. Uh, radar guided, not guided, but radar uh, solution is provided. And, uh, and you can throw some, some pretty tight shots downrange uh, in the air to ground mode. It's also got a great uh, air to ground mapping mode for picking up targets, especially in hard to, to locate areas especially before uh, the advent of GPS and the incorporation of GPS, we had to use that air to ground mapping capability to you know, maybe find a bridge and then, and then know that you know, from the end of that bridge, 
1.2 miles at you know a certain degree was your actual target. So easy to find the bridge on the radar and then you input the offset and then all of your systems, the radar, the forward looking infrared would slew over and pick up the, uh, pick up the target. So the air ground mapping capability was, was really important, uh, especially before we had GPS. <clears throat> Also has a very good surface search capability to detect uh, surface threats, ships uh, primarily. And uh, you know, the, the mission incorporates so many different weapons. We'll talk about that in a second. But again, the radar is designed for multifunction, air to air, air to ground, um, anti-surface, close air support, all kinds of great missions. Uh, moving back here again, another, another AOA probe, pitot tube more ECM. Here's your fuel access panel. So that's typically handled by either the, you know, the ground crew or when you're on the aircraft carrier. A lot of times during initial carrier operations, we would do what's called a, a hot seat. And so, you know, if you hadn't been to the ship in, you know, two or three months, you're a little bit rusty. It's a very perishable skill. You go out and you knock out your, your arrested landings. You leave the airplane running, shut down the right engine, or correction, shut down the left engine so you could drop the ladder. And then uh, they would plug in the hose, top it back off, and then uh, swap out the pilots. So that way the maintenance crew didn't have to do a turnaround inspection and you just kept the thing running the whole time. So uh, gas, is, uh, gas is good. All right, fuel doors, UHF antenna. Um, this is the hold back. I didn't talk about that earlier. And this is, again, part of, of the carrier uh, operations. That plugs into the, the hold back, which is on the aircraft carrier itself. And once enough thrust is applied, both with uh, full power or afterburner, plus more importantly, the, the shot of the catapult, it actually breaks the hold back fitting. And that's what sends you down, uh, down the catapult stroke. So it's a, it's a little piece of, I'm not sure what's made out of some sort of alloy, but it's perfectly designed and engineered uh, so that once the right stress is put on it, it breaks in half. And it's obviously one time use only. Uh, and then as soon as the airplane launched, you can see those guys throw the, uh, the unused portion or the used portion over, uh, overboard. All right, moving back. Uh, this is your, obviously your intakes. We'll talk a little bit more about the engines later. Um, again, big beefy gear here, uh, suitable for carrier landings. You can see how, you know, with this offset trailing gear like this, a lot of the shock from that impact is gonna be uh, absorbed through a rotation. And then you know this uh, snubber is going to going to pick up a lot of that, sort of a shock absorber. Uh, 210 knots max speed on the uh, on the main mounts. Um, again, a speed that you pretty rarely see. You've also got incorporated here uh, these tie downs. So this is you know really important on the on the aircraft carrier for tying and chaining this thing down on the deck of of the uh, aircraft carrier. You've got pad eyes everywhere. So no matter where you park, you can hook a chain up to this thing, hook it up here, and there's points all around the airplane that do similar things. And sometimes when you know, you're facing a really serious sea state and you're taking green water over the bow of the ship, well, you gotta strap these airplanes down because they're not inexpensive. And uh, so having all those hook points or correction, all those tie downs uh, is critical to uh, securing the airplanes on the flight deck. This is, uh, this is what, the, what we call the cheek mount. So there are nine stations on the Hornet for a combination of air to air and air to ground missiles, uh, external fuel tanks, um, and, uh, and targeting pods. So starting from the left to right, um, you know, station one is, is the wingtip, uh, and then you've got two internal stations. On the opposite side uh, of the airplane, you've got a similar cheek station. Typically is gonna be your forward-looking infrared uh, pod, their targeting pod. Normally the center station uh, is gonna be an external fuel tank, and then this station typically is gonna be used um, for an air-to-air -air missile, if, if it's used at all. Okay, uh, an AMRAM can slide up in there, uh, an AIM-7 Sidewinder. And then you'll have other hard points here. Uh, typically, again, this is a Blue Angel air show jet. So, you know, no fuel tanks, no pylons. It's, it's slick, it's waxed, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a G machine. But in a normal mission or training configuration, you typically have at least one or two uh, pylons that would be mounted here and here. And on those pylons, you could have anything from dumb bombs to uh, air-to-ground missiles, air-to-air -air missiles, uh, you name it, all, all the various uh, ordnance. I think the Hornet carries more different types of ordnance uh, than any other uh, aircraft in Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force. 
So, because it can do pretty much every mission, about the only mission it can't do is anti-submarine warfare. Um, even uh, air to air tanking is now capable with the, the new version of the Super Hornet. It's not a real exciting mission, but uh, it's nice to have that organic capability to refuel. Um, then walking all the way out here, this is, this is station nine. Uh, this, the only thing you really can put on here is a, an AIM-9 Sidewinder, which has the ability for uh, the, using the helmet mounted queuing system. So you can literally be pointing that direction, look this direction, uh, using the helmet mounted queuing site, you can uh, force the heat seeker of the missile to follow your, basically your eyes, and you can lock, off, uh, lock up a, a target uh, off bore site. You don't have to actually turn the nose and point it to them uh, and get the, the seeker on it like I had to do back in the day. Um, and so you can do that, slew the seeker there, lock it up, pull the trigger, and then off she goes. So it's, it's pretty, pretty effective. So on a, a carrier at sea, there's always, um, there's always a shortage of space, right? You always need more room on that flight deck. And uh, especially when you've got 15 or 20 airplanes that are getting ready to come down and land, uh, you got to get these airplanes parked off the side, clear the, the landing area. And so you need to stack these things up like cordwood and by having this ability to fold the wings. So right here, this is the seam where the wing folds up. So that buys you, you know, about another five feet on each side. So another 10 feet. Uh, so it reduces the, the lateral displacement by about 10 feet. That's controlled inside the cockpit, just to pull and rotate and then the wings fold up. Um, obviously when you fold those things down, you want to make sure that that's properly seated. There's actually a, <clears throat> we call them the beer cans. Uh, it's an indicator that pops up so that when you extend the wings, the, the beer can still sticks up, but only in, until you, you know, completely seat and lock the wing fold mechanism, then the beer cans are, are hidden. So it's always one of the last checklist items uh, as you're taxiing up to the catapult. Double check, make sure those beer cans are down, that those wings are locked. Because taking off with unlocked wings, not be a good thing. These are the trailing edge flaps. Um, you know, this is a fly-by-wire aircraft. So there's no direct mechanical linkage between the control stick and the flight control surfaces. There is a, a direct linkage to the stabilators, but only in an emergency mode. So primarily, uh, as a pilot, you're sort of a voting member, right? So you say, okay, this is what I want to do with the airplane. The two flight control computers then analyze, okay, what are you trying to do here? Okay, based on stick, throttle, rudder inputs, okay, you're trying to do a 6G uh, aggressive turn to the left. And so the flight control computers then send the signals through hydraulic actuators to the flight control surfaces to deflect and to affect the, uh, the maneuver that the pilot's trying to, uh, to achieve. So it's fly-by-wire, it's a little different, uh, but what it does is, you know, this airplane is designed to be incredibly unstable. Um, and what that does is, is, it, is it allows it to be a lot more maneuverable. Uh, and it's incredibly maneuver, maneuverable, very sensitive to control inputs, uh, terrific in a dogfight scenario. But if without those flight control computers constantly making those fine-tuned corrections, uh, it'd be a much less stable uh, and unpredictable airplane. So uh, kind of an interesting design behind it. And that's why when you have a full degrade mode of the flight control computers, mission's over and you're just trying to get the thing on deck um, in mech mode which I've done in the simulator, uh, it's just very sensitive and touchy, and you really just want to set yourself up for a nice, you know, 10 miles straight in, drop the tail hook, and, and take an arrested landing. So it gets a little bit tricky. I don't think anyone has ever landed on the aircraft carrier in mech mode. It's a real emergency. Thankfully, the flight control computers are, uh, are really reliable. They're redundant, so if you lose one, the other one picks up the slack. So um, very capable flight control system. So on the Blue Jets, um, this is a, a night formation light, and there are several lights uh, along the side, and, and it's a, a great airplane at night. Uh, as Navy and Marine Corps pilots, we spend a lot of time flying at night, flying with NVGs. We we're well ahead of the Air Force in terms of adopting that technology. Obviously, flying with the Blue Angels, we're not going to fly with NG, NVGs. We do very little flying at night. Um, this, this was a little bit of a challenge once. We came back from an air show. Uh, typically, we come back on, on Sundays. And a lot of times we're coming in at or sometimes after sunset. <clears throat> and the boss decided, let's come in. You know, it's getting pretty dark, but we can still come in in formation. We'll do our standard pitch out to land. And we realized really quickly how hard it was to see the airplane without, without these lights because they're super dark to begin with. And the light was, you know, the sun was setting fast. 
And uh, I can't remember how we handled that. I think we just loosened things up really, really loose. Definitely not Blue Angel formation standards. Um, and it was a debrief item. Boss, we can't really fly formation at night with, uh, without these, these formation lights. It's just not very safe. So big vertical stabs. Um, you got the rudders here. And you know, there's actually a lot of rudder authority with this airplane, especially in slow speed flight. Um, these are the stabs or the stabilators. Pilots just refer to them as, as stabs. The entire thing moves, so it's not you know, just an elevator with, with a control surface and back. The entire thing moves, and that really gives you a lot of pitch authority, especially in slow speed flight. So the stabs are really important. Uh, same thing with the rudders. Um, you know, the Hornet, in terms of air-to-air -air capabilities, uh, if you find yourself in a 1v1 scenario, in a dogfight scenario with a bad guy, um, a lot of people, I think, think, well, it's whoever can turn the fastest, whoever can sustain the most Gs, whoever has the most thrust to weight. Sometimes it's who can fly the slowest. And most flights or fights boil down to, to two scenarios. You either have a rate fight or a radius fight. And the Hornet loves a radius fight because we can slow down and get into this radius fight, which ends up being sort of a scissors type scenario. And if, if you can be the guy that can fly the slowest and the other guy sort of flushes out in front of you, now you'll line fuselages and drop in for a raking gunshot and a kill. So flying slow sometimes is really important uh, in, the, uh, in the Blue Angel demo, uh, pilot number five does a high alpha pass, high angle of attack pass. And he comes by, uh, I think his indicated airspeed is probably around, oh, 110, 115 knots. Um, and there's actually a margin of safety there. I think he's only at 25 alpha. We can sustain 35 alpha, but uh, the margin of safety there is in case he loses one motor, he can still fly out of that, which is just one motor and full afterburner. Uh, but if there's a pretty good uh, left to right headwind uh, and he's flying at, at that angle of attack, it almost looks like he's just, you know, just about to fall out of the sky. It's pretty impressive. Also up here, you've got the fuel dumps. Um, th those two pods on top are, are ECM pods, but below that is the, uh, the dump for the fuel. And um, the Hornet, you know, is always kind of thirsty. That's one of the probably one of the drawbacks and it's part of the reason why they came up with the, the Super Hornet, which is about 30% bigger, has a lot more um, payload capability, a lot more fuel. So the Hornet's always kind of thirsty, but when you're flying at the ship, um, when you come aboard to, uh, to land, your max allowable weight is 34,000 pounds. And so, especially at night, usually you like to have a little bit of gravy because um, you don't want to be low on gas at night in the middle of the ocean. Um, so typically pilots will leave a little bit of extra gas. You sort of build what we call a fuel ladder. So you've got checkpoints every 15 minutes. You can kind of check in, see how you're doing. Once you get to a certain point, you say, okay, fun's over, no more mission training. Let's just either hit the tanker or I need to just max conserve, right? And then you come in and hopefully you can make up a little bit of gas by being in that max conserve kind of mindset. And then as you come down on the approach at night, once you get inside of about 10 miles, you can set your bingo bug, turn on your dumps, and this is where the fuel comes out. Maybe you've got you know, an extra 1,000 pounds of gas or so, and uh, dump it down so that when you make that ball call, you're right at 34,000 pounds. That way, if something happens, you get waved off, there's a foul deck, you, you bolter, meaning you, you land long and miss all the wires. You got a little bit of extra gas for hopefully at least two more looks before they send you up to the tanker, if there is a tanker. So gas is good. Yeah, here you can really see the kind of the, the surface area of the stabs. And again, this entire thing moves together. Uh, obviously, either side moves independently for increased roll rate uh, and responsiveness, but a lot of surface area here. Great engines, uh, GE 400s or 402s in the uh, enhanced performance uh, version, which picks up an extra 2,000 pounds of thrust and afterburner. Uh, total, uh, you're looking at about 36,000 pounds of thrust in full afterburner. Basic weight of the airplane is around 24,000 pounds. So depending on configuration and loadout, usually you've got you know, greater than a one-to-one -one thrust to weight sometime in the first part of the mission. Okay, critically important part uh, of, of gear here, piece of gear, is the tail hook. Uh, obviously this one's painted nice and blue uh, for the Blue Angel jet. But this, uh, again, you're coming in at, at roughly 140 knots and uh, you go from 140 to zero in about two seconds, uh, maybe a second and a half. So this thing has to take an incredible amount of stress. I talked a little bit about the, the hook 
and how effective it is at grabbing the arresting cable. Um, this hook point can be replaced. I can't remember if it's every 10 or every 50 traps, but they can remove this and replace the hook point because this is what takes the, the majority of the stress. The rest of the hook uh, typically stays on a, a lot longer. Um, you know, this is not only used for carrier operations. If you've got an emergency ashore, uh, just doing regular training and you've got an engine fire or you've got, um, you know, flight control problems, um, you might want to just drop this hook. Most Navy and Marine Corps bases have the short field resting gear uh, is rigged up. And of course, uh, carrier pilots are, are real comfortable with taking a trap, whether it's on a ship or, or on land. And so, you know, if you lose your hydraulics, you've got degraded flight controls, whatever the situation is, dropping the hook and taking a trap is nice. Uh, this can also be used if you have to do a high speed abort. Uh, we talked about that scenario you're up, you know, high, hot uh, Fallon with a big, heavy loadout. If you have to do a high speed abort at, you know, 160 knots, you go idle, uh, speed brakes, you're not gonna slow this thing down in time to, to stop from going over the end. So drop the hook about a thousand feet prior and you're gonna catch that overrun gear and that's gonna keep you from going off into the tumbleweeds. So apparently they've removed um, the oil system for the museum, but normally you'd have a tube extending out from that port, dropping along the top of the afterburner and then ending here in the port engine exhaust. Um, that's where the linseed oil that's again housed up in the gun housing. Uh, the linseed oil is, is, uh, is fed into the exhaust and just the heat of the exhaust basically turns that oil into that really pretty white smoke that's used in the air shows. Um, one thing that's kind of unique is uh, if the pilot for some reason has to select full afterburner, uh, it becomes so hot back here that it actually completely vaporizes that oil. So if you see the, the Blue Angels are watching a show, and especially on one of the crossing maneuvers where everyone's trying to cross at the center point. If one guy's a little bit behind, he may go to full afterburner and you'll see the smoke will actually disappear until he deselects afterburner and then the smoke will come back on. Even though he's not actually turning it on and off, it's just the afterburner vaporizes the, uh, the oil. Uh, and again, that's linseed oil. They say it's biodegradable, so. Moving around here, uh, again, you know, this is painted up as the number four jet. So I'll just explain real quickly the various positions and the numbers associated with the Blue Angels. Uh, number one is, is the flight leader. He's also the boss, uh, the commanding officer. So he's, he's kind of the old guy, right? Here I am, 51. Uh, the boss is usually in his early 40s. Post-command tour has had a, a, stellar, uh, a stellar career so far. Very strict uh, and competitive selection process. One of the things that's interesting is that in the history, 75 years of, of the Blue Angels, there have only been a few bosses who were formerly wingmen who later in their career became the flight leader or boss. I think there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, uh, a two or three year tour on the Blue Angels is, is really challenging. Uh, the flying's really hard, the, the pace is, is super hard. It's kind of like being a rock star in terms of the, you know, the constant time on the road. Uh, again, the flying's incredibly difficult, hardest flying I've ever done. Uh, after two years, usually you're like, this has been really great, glad I did it, but it's time to move on. Um, and so maybe that's part of it, is guys that have done it, sort of check that block, there's no reason to try to do it again. The flat, the low, and the high are the three different sort of sequences that we fly. And you gotta take that, those three sequences and that template, and you gotta take it to a new show site. And there might be, you know, they're gonna be completely different checkpoints. While the new jets have GPS, the blues still rely 100% on the eyeball and visual, physical check, checkpoints, whether it's a, you know, a street crossing, a, you know, a, a building, a water tower. Um, and so you've got to learn this new show site every time you go somewhere else. It may have different terrain. Uh, you may be different elevation, which drastically affects performance of the airplane, roll rate. Um, and then obviously you're gonna have different environmentals. Day one, you know, first day you get there, you might have a headwind. Uh, the next day you might have one that's from crowd right to crowd left. Uh, the next day might be calm, the next day might be windy. And so the boss is trying to constantly adjust, not only take this template and perform well and consistently at a different show site, but now he's got to adjust for all the changing environmentals. And you may have a situation where we start out and we're gonna do a high show, and then a layer of clouds rolls in. Boss, let's transition to the low show. Roger that, low show. So now you're flying a different show. He's got to make that transition in the middle of everything. So the boss has a really hard job. That's why he's the most experienced uh, pilot, has the most hours, uh, and has the most responsibility. Number two is the right wingman. Um, typically, number two flies that position for both years. Uh, it's typically a two-year tour. 
and it's in an opposite rotation. So when you've got a first year number two, you've got a second year boss. So what he's trying to do that year is not only learn how to be a good number two, but the next year, his primary role as a second year number two is training a first year number one. So that's where he spends all his time, is in the debrief, it's one-on-one -on -one with him and the boss as they go through every maneuver. Uh, number three is the left wingman. That's the position that I flew um, both my first year and, and my third year. Uh, number three is, is the left wingman. Most of the turns in the sequence in the Blue Angel show is left turns. Navy pilots love left turns. The pattern at the aircraft carrier is a left, is a left pattern. Uh, and the Blue Angel air show is designed primarily around left turns. What that means for the, for the number three pilot is most of the turns are into you, right? So you're looking up into the sun, you're looking up into the blue sky, harder to sort of judge the roll rate of, of the boss. That's where it's incredibly important for the boss to be really consistent with the pace of roll, pace of, of onset, because a lot of times as number three, especially if you're looking into the sun, you're just going off muscle memory. And when he makes his call, you just go, even if you can't see perfectly your checkpoints. So that's number three. Number three, then, his second year slides into the slot. And the primary role of the slot pilot is to be the training officer during the, the winter season, which is about um, two and a half months long out in the desert. And because he has the best seat in the house underneath the boss, and he can see the wingtips of two and three, uh, and also quickly look down and cross-check airspeed, altitude, other parameters. Uh, and he's a second year guy, so he knows, you know, kind of knows how things are supposed to, to be playing out. He's also the safety officer, right? So he can call no maneuvers, he can call a knock it off. He can tell either wingman to clear if they're moving too much or he sees they're out of parameters. So it's really important to have that number four position be a second year guy, <clears throat> second year pilot. Five and six are the opposing solos. Uh, five is the lead solo, six is the opposing solo. Five is a third year uh, pilot. Typically, the narrator is seven, uh, and after his narrating year, he be becomes six, then five. So six always moves into five. Opposing solo becomes lead solo. Uh, so the lead solo, is, as it, the name suggests, is in charge of the two solos. He's leading the comms uh, and, and the coordination between the solo maneuvers and the diamond maneuvers. So he's listening to what the boss is saying. He kind of knows where they are on the maneuver. and then he calls in the solos for the next maneuvers. So he's really leading the, the five and six show. Then at the end, uh, usually for the last three or four maneuvers, five and six join up with the diamond, which is one through four, and that forms the delta, which is the six plane uh, formation that finishes up the show for the last three or four maneuvers. So that's kind of the numbers and the rotation. Again, number seven is, uh, is the narrator. He's also a pilot. Um, he flies with uh, an air crewman in his back seat flies to the show site a day early, so typically on Wednesday, and he's checking for everything from airspace, briefing rooms, rental cars, hotels. He also does three media flights. It's a really long day. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the backseater, uh, what we call the seven geek, who flies with number seven, uh, he does all the media briefs. He handles a lot of the, the prep for the maintenance, make sure all the spare parts are there, all the support equipment that they need, all the space that they need for, for spare parts, et cetera, uh, is available. So that crew, uh, they typically start their Wednesdays at about five in the morning and they don't wrap it up until about 10 at night. It's a really long day. And sort of the reward for number seven is after that really difficult year, he gets to be a solo pilot. Because those guys just go out and rock and roll and really bend this thing around. Whereas, you know, the diamond pilots were kind of, it's kind of like uh, a prison says, sentence without parole. You're locked in there, you know, for 45 minutes for the, for the most part. So, all right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of perspective of sort of the building block approach that the Blue Angels take to uh, flying really precise and, and, and close formation, which is really the, the signature of the Blue Angels. Um, every pilot that comes to the Blue Angels, Navy, Marine Corps, has spent a lot of time flying formation. So everybody knows how to fly formation pretty well, but we're trying to take it to a whole new level of, of precision. And to that end, um, we use some different checkpoints on the airplane, very different than what we would use in the fleet, and it allows us to be a lot more precise. Um, we call it flying paint because while all this paint looks really pretty and says Blue Angels and advertisement for Boeing uh, Hornets, um, it actually serves a, a terrific purpose. So this piece of gear is called the Lex Fence. And I'm not going to go into the aerodynamics of it, but it serves a purpose uh, to help with stability and airflow. But the way the Blue Angels use it is we'll use the top of that Lex Fence, so the, the yellow line across the top, and we'll put it underneath where it says Hornet. So that sort of defines 
how deep or how flat you're going to be. So if you're perfectly um, the right depth, you're going to have that yellow, top yellow line is right underneath Hornet. Then we're going to triangulate that and we're going to cut off the tail end of Hornet. So all you can see is the H, okay? You can only see the H just above that yellow line. You want to try to get an angle on it? So you should only see the H. You shouldn't see a O R N E T. And that defines your bearing line. And then you're going to follow that bearing line all the way down here. And this is this is a starting training set. So this is kind of you know week one as, as a new blue angel. You're going to follow that bearing line all the way down until you're flush with the aft end of the afterburner cans. So your actual position is probably about 15 feet that way. Okay. So it's not a very tight set. Okay. You're pretty loose, probably not too dissimilar to how we fly in the fleet. So it's pretty comfortable. What's different is when we start going out there, just building blocks, basics, turning the smoke on and off together, right? And now the boss starts doing some turns, turns and reversals. That's the first thing that we do. And if you're in that position and you get to a point where you're deep enough that you can't see that H anymore, or you're flat enough that there's another letter or so of depth beneath it, so that's your flat and deep, or if you're a letter forward or a letter aft, you're out of position. Those are the tolerances. And if you're out of position, you call clear. And that lets the slot pilot know, lets your wingman know, guys, I'm not flying up to Blue Angel standards in this, in this maneuver. Typically, this, you'll turn off the smoke. Typically, the slot pilot will take a look. Okay, you're, you're stabilized now. You're clear to rejoin. Okay. And if you can get to where you're flying at those tolerances, where you can keep that letter exactly where it's supposed to be, now you start moving it up a little bit. Okay, now we're going to go to HO. And we're going to move up to the forward burner band. And then the next week, we might step all the way up to the aft end of the bureau number, and now we see HOR. And then later in the season, well, you get to a point where you just fly as close as you can to the wingtip without touching. So the checkpoints sort of go out, of the, out the window later in the season. I want to show you another checkpoint. Um, and it's not painted on this airplane. They must have uh, painted over it just for the museum. But this bolt that holds on, helps to hold on this Lex fence, is normally painted yellow. And the reason that's painted yellow is because that bolt is the checkpoint for the number three pilot for the Diamond 360. So normally, uh, and I flew the number three slot, uh, number three position, normally the objective is to put that bolt right here in this corner so that all you can see is that bolt, right? So that's your bearing line. Follow it down here. My head is probably going to be, you know, we typically don't go inside the wing fold. So on a, on a real calm, smooth day, later in the season, this is probably five, six months into the season, uh, if you've got a nice, calm day, you're going to tuck it in right here. It gets a little bit dark under here because you're under the wing. Uh, and typically in this set, uh, if the team is really gelling, the number three's right wing tip will be about a foot to two feet from the number two pilot's left wing tip. Uh, and you come back and watch the debrief and say, that looks pretty good. Let's do that again. You know, to that end, uh, paramount, uh, safety is paramount for the Blue Angels. Uh, one of the missions the team agrees upon every year is, guys, we want to put on a, a great show this year. Uh, we want to be safe. And we want to fly really tight sets over the course of time uh, in a really safe fashion, but we never want to trade paint. We never want to touch. So Butch Voris, who was, who was the, the first boss and flight leader of the Blue Angels, one of his wingmen asked him, boss, how tight do you think we should fly? He said, well, if you never touch, we're not trying hard enough. But if we do touch, it's a little too close. I didn't point this out on the other side, but uh, this is the, uh, the port nav light, red on this side, green on the other side. And again, uh, you've got NGG lights, various strips along the fuselage. So four of the, of the nav lights, this part of the airframe is, is referred to as the LEX, L-E-X. 
Uh, not exactly sure what that stands for, but it's, it's part of the aerodynamic design of the Hornet um, as to the stability and maneuverability. It is a little bit of a detractor sometimes if you're, you know, you're trying to look down and pick out a target, but thankfully you can just roll up and pick out your target. But it does block visibility a little bit uh, looking straight down. Uh, also stored inside this is the ladder and pretty easy to pop this baby down. So makes it easy to climb up. The challenge sometimes is if you're on a cross country and you land at maybe an FBO where the ground crew isn't familiar with it, uh, there's no button you can push to extend this ladder. So you have to sort of coach these guys into how to open this thing up. And sometimes that's a three or four minute process, but uh, it's nice to have the built in uh, ladder here. Okay, we're going to take a little look inside the, uh, the cockpit here, but before we do, I want to explain the story behind the, the name on this jet. So, Lieutenant Commander Pat Walsh, uh, call sign is Sponge, and now he's never given me the actual story of Sponge, but this is my interpretation. He, he, he is a sponge of knowledge. He doesn't forget anything. He's one of the smartest people I know. He's got a, a PhD from Tufts, and when he was on the Blue Angels, everyone knew he was going to be an admiral, and sure enough, he ended up being a four-star admiral. Uh, retired, his last command was commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, largest uh, geographic command of any military command. Um, Pat is from Dallas originally, and when he retired from the Navy, he came back here uh, to live in Dallas in his hometown. And when the Dallas tailhookers decided and were able to, to get this Blue Angel jet here, we, they thought it was only fitting, and I agree with them, that Lieutenant Commander Pat Walsh, uh, his name be on the side. So there was a great event and uh, ceremony honoring him and his accomplishments, not just with the Blue Angels, but in the Navy. Um, Pat was on the team. He was on the first team with the F-18. So he actually uh, flew the A-4 Skyhawk the last two years of the Skyhawk. And they, what they did was they froze the team and then transitioned to the F-18. So they kept all the same pilots. So there were no, no newbies on the team. They had a bunch of experienced pilots. The thing that was challenging was he was the only one that had any F-18 time because it was such a new airplane. He had been an instructor in the Hornet for a, a brief period of time. And uh, he tells some great stories about, you know, they're basically Blue Angel test pilots because they're trying to take this new airframe that has never been through, you know, these, these paces and these types of maneuvers, and they're trying to figure it out. So uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of lessons learned, probably a few close calls, but they did it safely. Uh, they did it the right way, and they passed down uh, a great turnover to the next team as, as they kind of slowly transition to, uh, to future teams. The, uh, the Legacy Hornet ended up flying from, what was it, 19, I think it was 1985 or 86, uh, and then this last year was, was their last year. So the longest serving platform by far of any platform uh, on, the, uh, on the Blue Angels. So Pat Walsh, is, uh, he's the man. All right, now let's take a little, little tour inside the cockpit. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's primarily a glass cockpit with the multifunction displays. Uh, that allow the pilot really to select and, and manage all modes, uh, everything from fuel transfer to systems, troubleshooting, your radar displays, ECM, uh, all your stores page, uh, your radar. Uh, most of the time, your navigation information is, is down below. So that's where the pilot spends a lot of time, um, where his eyeballs are scanning, in addition to the heads-up display. Uh, a lot of pilots, F-18 pilots, are accused of being HUD cripples. Um, it's because there's so much information available in the heads-up display, uh, not only in instrument flight or uh, approaches to the carrier, but in air-to-air, air-to-ground missions. And what it allows the pilot to do is, is spend a lot more time uh, with his head up and out of the cockpit. We say, you know, get your head up out of the drool bucket and, uh, and get your eyeballs out because that's where the threat is. So the heads-up display is, is incredibly capable. The, pilot, the pilot's hands, of course, spend most of their time on the stick and on the throttle. And there are a lot of controls on, on both the stick and the throttle. It's a system called HOTAS, which stands for Hands on Throttle and Stick. So I'll try to walk you through, if I can remember, uh, some of the functionality of these various uh, control switches. Uh, this little castle switch is primarily used for selecting various modes of the, uh, the radar, both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground mode, uh, locking up targets, etc. Um, this uh, this switch is used primarily for trim. Really, this airplane doesn't require the pilot to trim much at all, um, only in, primarily in dirty configurations for approach and landing. 
Also, lateral trim sometimes is used if you have an asymmetric load on the wings. If you got maybe a, an extra fuel tank on, on the starboard side, that requires you to trim it to the left so that when you take off, the airplane uh, maintains level flight. Uh, this button primarily is for weapons release, air to grounds weapons release, both uh, dumb bombs, smart bombs, air to ground missiles, etc. Um, this rocker switch is used for weapon select. Uh, so down is gun, aft is heat seeking sidewinder, forward is AIM 7 um, Sparrow, and then to the right is AIM 120 AMRAAM. Um, and then we've got, you can't see it from there, you've got the, uh, the nose wheel steering switch, which is used for various modes uh, of the radar. Also, when you're on the ground, if you push and hold that, uh, it engages high gain nose wheel steering. So you can turn that nose uh, wheel up to 60 degrees, which is really important as you're trying to maneuver, you know, right up next to the scupper on the aircraft carrier, trying to get into a really tight parking spot. Um, there's also a paddle switch. This is used various functions, turning off the autopilot, a couple other uh, administrative functions. Uh, and then the trigger, which has been removed uh, on the Blue Angel jet. Obviously, we're not going to be doing any real missions in this, but I'll talk a little bit more about um, the stick and then why there's tape on the control stick. Um, continuing on the functionality, the HOTAS functionality on the throttles, you know, you've got two throttles, one for port and starboard. Uh, you've got a finger lift that's for uh, going through the idle stop when you want to shut down or in flight if you need to sh shut down a single engine, you can lift that and, uh, and shut down a, a troubled engine. Um, a couple buttons here on the outboard. Um, this outboard button, not used too much, selects a couple different modes of the, uh, the FLIR. Center button is for auto throttles, both in cruise mode and approach mode. Uh, a lot of pilots like to use that coming aboard the ship. Uh, this little toggle switch is its kind of like a mouse. It controls the cursor on your radar primarily. It allows you to sample different targets of, of interest, uh, see you know, altitude, airspeed, vector information. So that controls primarily the, uh, the cursor. Uh, here's your chaff flare switch, which on a Blue Angel jet, uh, this is uh, smoke on and smoke off. Uh, normally it's chaff and flares. This is your comm switch, uh, comm one and comm two. Uh, you've got your speed brake switch. You pull that aft and hold it out. That extends the speed brake, which is you know, a big, a big uh, surface between the vertical stabs, primarily used just in landing. Uh, this helps slow the airplane down or in an abort scenario. Um, not sure what that does, I forgot. And uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the, the throttle. So you know, between the stick and the throttle, uh, a pilot can execute probably 90% of any mission just using the, the HOTAS capabilities. Uh, it's a little bit like playing a musical instrument, right? If you're a musician, which I'm not, you can look at a scale, you can look at a series of notes and your fingers just kind of move and, and, and go the, where they need to go. Very similar for a Hornet pilot. Obviously it takes time, but uh, we call it doing the piccolo drill. So, you know, you're trying to execute a mission, lock up a target, shoot a missile, drop a bomb. Um, you just, your fingers just know where to go. Um, and there's very little reaching up and touching the screens to, uh, to actually execute the mission. So it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> Let's see, a couple other things. Uh, here you've got an emergency jettison switch that jettisons all external stores. Uh, most likely scenario is you're going off the front end of the aircraft carrier. For some reason, you get a soft uh, catapult or they dial in the wrong weight, which very rare that that happens. But if it does, you don't have enough end speed, you start swinging, sinking toward the, uh, the, the blue water, you punch this and it's going to get rid of all your stores, you know, anywhere from uh, four to, to 15,000 pounds of stores immediately. Um, this is the extension for the launch bar. Talked about that earlier. Here's your flap switch, taxi light. Uh, this is an emergency canopy jettison. Um, if you have a, you know, a fire around you or a fire in the cockpit, you need to get that thing open now. Pull this and the canopy is going to get launched up uh, you know, 20 or 30 feet up in the air, hopefully clear the aircraft. <clears throat> so this airplane has been modified slightly. Normally in a Blue Angel jet, uh, and they must have taken it out, but normally there's a kind of an old school track and field stopwatch mounted here. Very securely mounted. It's got brackets around it. And that's, that's used by the solo pilots, number five and six. And they use visual checkpoints at three miles, two miles, a mile and a half, and one mile. And they use that stopwatch uh, and flying specific ground speeds to try to affect uh, a perfect hit or cross right at center point. So I won't go into the details, but it's, it's old school. It's the same way that uh, solo pilots have been trying to affect that cross for the Blue Angels for the last 75 years. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's true uh, piloting and, and flying airspeed and, and using visual checkpoints. The other thing that's missing here, uh, back to carrier operations, normally you would have the, uh, the angle of attack indicator here. As I mentioned, you know, normally you're looking through the HUD, kind of to the side to see your lineup, and then uh, the periphery, uh, you can see whether you're on speed there, looking for that nice amber donut for on speed indication. Uh, let's see, moving around, you've got all your standby instruments here. Uh, here's your tail hook. This is where you drop this. Um, so if you're hanging out overhead the ship and getting ready to go land, that's the first item on the checklist. This is where you safe the ejection seat. If you happen to eject over uh, mountainous territory and the normal parachute opening schedule isn't going to work in, in a high terrain environment, you can go to the manual override and that's going to deploy the chute a little bit earlier. Uh, everything else here is primarily warning and caution lights, uh, generator controls, you've got instrument panel, uh, lighting, etc. Got a kind of a fun story about this. This is, this is called the Grimes light and really it's just used for emergencies in case you have a dual generator failure, some sort of total electrical failure. This thing is always able to be powered up so at least you can turn it on shine it on your standby uh, gyro and, and at least you have an attitude indicator and hopefully you can get it back on deck. Um, typically, US pilots will leave this stored and secured where it is, um, but I had the opportunity to get to know a, an Australian exchange pilot and there are a lot of other countries that fly the Hornet. Uh, Australia does, Spain flies it, Switzerland, Malaysia, I think there's four or five others. Um, and in Australia, they have a, a procedure for flying at night and that is to clip this Grimes light in a position that if you were to lose total electricity and turn it on, it's gonna shine directly on your, your standby instrument. So you're not fumbling around and trying to get this thing up there. Well, uh, the other thing that's, one thing that's different about the Aussie uh, airplane, and it's probably a lot of things that are different. I know they don't have all the bells and whistles we have, but uh, their canopy switch, which is right underneath the starboard rail, <coughs> uh, ours is, is somewhat easy to access you have to sort of reach up and around and there's no way you would accidentally bump it in flight uh, but it doesn't have any it's not a guarded switch so if you were flying along at 400 knots and you decided for some reason to reach under and, and pop the canopy this thing would be gone in a heartbeat right the aussies actually have a guarded switch over their canopy so they got to flip up the, the guard and then they can access the switch well mick was out on a training flight we were doing a night bombing training run with some new F-18 pilots out in Fallon. And as was his habit pattern, he rigged up the, the Grimes light right where it's supposed to be according to the, the Aussie standard operating procedures. And we rolled in on the first dive and he dropped his bombs and per procedure did a real aggressive four or five G pull out, max power, climbing away, trying to get away from the, the frag pattern. But in doing so, the Grimes light was perfectly positioned in the wrong location. It rotated forward and the trailing ed, uh, edge clipped the canopy switch. And as soon as that thing, the seal broke and hit the wind stream, it was gone. So he was in convertible mode, very loud, very dark, couldn't say anything, hear anything. He was effectively Nordo. Uh, he did a great job of getting it back aboard, but uh, needless to say, he had to alter his night flying uh, procedures for the Grimes light. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the, the control stick. Uh, again, you've got a lot of tape here, which is unusual. This is, this is something you'd only see in a Blue Angel jet. So if you were to talk to any military pilot or any pilot that's done any significant formation flying, they would tell you that one of the first things you learn in flying formation is you, you wanna be really light on the controls, right? You, you don't wanna squeeze the black out of the stick because then you're gonna be real herky-jerky. You're not gonna be very uh, precise with your controls. And uh, it's just not, it's just not, doesn't lead to smooth flying. And that applies for pretty much any, any phase of flight. Um, the challenge with, with flying Blue Angel formation, where you're trying to fly, you know, a couple feet away from each other, typically, you know, low to the ground, typically, you know, a little bit of bump in the air, some, we call it texture, because uh, you're flying in the afternoon, usually in the Midwest somewhere. So it's a little bit bumpy. Um, and so, you know, having those real loose light controls aren't great for precision formation flying. What Pat Walsh and, uh, and his team did in the A4 and predecessors is they would just roll in full forward elevator trim. 
so that you were working against the aerodynamic forces of the elevator, and that created sort of a positive feel. So that allowed you to be a little bit more precise. Yeah, you had to sort of squeeze the black out of the stick, but you put your forearm on your, uh, on your thigh, use a little bit of a fulcrum, and it allows you to be really stable and precise. It's a little bit like, you know, if you think about threading a needle. If, you, if I asked you to thread a needle, you, you wouldn't just take the needle and thread and, and just sort of eyeball it and, and go for it. You would probably push your palms against each other, give a little bit of positive force, and that's going to allow you to be really precise. So similar idea here where you've got your forearm resting on your thigh, you get that fulcrum, and now you're, you're really squeezing that stick and being very precise with, uh, with your inputs. The challenge with the F-18 is because it's fly-by-wire, you couldn't, the pilots, Pat Walsh and his team, couldn't just roll in full trim. It just, it didn't have the same effect. So what they ended up doing was coming up with a spring system, and it's been, most of it's been removed for the, for the museum. But the spring actually comes out of the, the ECM control panel and hooks onto this little tab and it pulls the stick forward. Uh, there's no hydraulic power here, so I can't move the stick, but it typically will pull the stick forward three or four inches. And when we start the training with, with the new pilots, typically it'll be about 30 pounds of force. Uh, and then as, as the strength in the forearms build up and as the team is, is flying closer and closer, we'll add the tension on the spring. We'll get to about 40 pounds of tension. Uh, and that just allows the pilots to be really, really precise. Um, you know, we always kind of joke the diamond pilots especially end up having, you know, forearms that are about three or four inches in diameter bigger than their left arms because you're just constantly squeezing uh, the black out of that stick and, and making those precise inputs. So this leads to another sort of unique aspect of the Blue Angels uh, and why the, the team doesn't wear G-suits, which most fighter pilots are going to wear on any mission. Uh, the way a G-suit works is it's effectively a series of bladders that start from below your calf, move up through your thighs and across your, your abdomen. And then it plugs into um, this system back here, which provides conditioned bleed air to, uh, to the G-suit. So when the airplane senses it's under G's, and it usually starts as, as soon as two or three G's, it starts to add air to the, to the G-suit, it inflates those bladders and it squeezes and compresses uh, around your, your muscles of, you know, from your abdomen down. And that helps to push the blood up from the bottom of your extremities up to your brain. It's kind of like squeezing you know, a, a tube of toothpaste from the bottom. You want all that pressure and force coming from the bottom, pushing the blood and countering the, the G-forces that are being induced by the airplane. Um, it's just to give you a sense of what it feels like. It's a lot like you know, if you go and get your, your blood pressure taken, and you know, they you know, put that uh, collar on there and pump it up. Very similar, but it's all throughout your, your legs and your abdomen. The challenge for the Blue Angels is, you know, if you're sitting in here and you've got your rudder pedals pulled back and you've got your forearm resting on your thigh to create that fulcrum, uh, if you've got a G-suit on and now it starts inflating and deflating, that's inevitably going to move your arm, which is going to move the stick. And when you're trying to fly a couple feet apart, it's not a good thing. So no G-suits for the Blue Angels. Um, we train for that, we prepare for that uh, as we start the season. Everybody, new, new members, old members, everyone goes out to the centrifuge, does a full 8G spin up with no G suit just to make sure you've got excellent technique uh, and you're able to counter those forces without, it, without a G suit. It helps too that you know, we're typically flying uh, six days a week and just like anything, if you're a runner, if you lift weights, the more you do something, the more you build up a tolerance for it. So um, you, you get to be kind of a G monster after a while. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, one Blue Angel story I want to share with you too is, so the, the team typically has 10 or 11, sometimes 12 jets assigned just depending on availability. Um, typically on a, a road show, it'll be just the, the six planes in the Delta plus number seven, uh, the narrator will go a day in advance. But we do have a couple two-seaters. Um, and so when the new guys join, or gals, uh, join the team, they'll travel with the team for typically the last six or seven weeks of the year just to soak everything up, listen to the briefs, and, and one of the things that the new folks get to do is get a backseat ride, typically two with the diamond and two with the solos. So you throw the two-seater into the formation, and I still remember my first ride in the back seat, and usually it's with number four, the slot pilot. So, you know, you're, you're right there under the boss with the two wingmen, and it was a beautiful day. We were in El Centro, California, and we took off and slid. I mean, we were three feet off the deck, and four's putting in a full booter left rudder and driving into that slot. 
Next thing you know, two and three come sliding in, and I look up and I see, you know, two's left wing tip, three's right wing tip. And my first reaction was to reach down to the ejection elevation switch and lower the seat as low as I could because it was so uncomfortable to have two wingtips right above me. I felt like I could reach up and grab them. And next thing you know, we're going up into a loop. And my thir first thought was, you got the wrong guy. You know, I, I can't hack this. I There's no way. There is no way. Um, but again, through that building block approach, uh, as we always say, you know, you could, you could teach a monkey to do this stuff. So. So I've got another story for you. Uh, this is when I was a, an instructor two or three years before I became a, a Blue Angel. And um, we were doing a low level strike. It was kind of a graduation exercise for a, a strike class that was going through. And, and I was, my role was to be the, the, the safety pilot. So I was the sort of tail end Charlie. It was eight of us doing a, a low level, probably 150 mile route. Uh, minimum altitude was, was 200 feet. So we were down pretty low and doing anywhere from 480 to 540 knots uh, ground speed. So really a fun flight. And then as we got close to the target, the mission objective was to pop up to about uh, 12,000 feet, roll inverted, acquire the target, roll in and drop all of our bombs, go home and have a cold beer. Um, so everything was going great, um, but it was a late afternoon flight. And the last leg had us uh, flying west, kind of due into, I wouldn't call it a setting sun, but the sun was at a, at a pretty low, low angle. I was offset a little bit to the north of the of the strike package and I could see them on my radar but I, I wanted to try to visually acquire them before we went into this dynamic maneuver. So I was looking a little bit to my left uh, and then out of nowhere I see this tower shows up and it wasn't on the charts. We briefed all the obstructions and you know this last leg was supposed to be clear. Unfortunately uh, the person in, in charge of updating the chart didn't do his job and so next thing you know I'm staring at this 299 foot tire uh, tower with guy wires coming out from the very top um, I rolled the plane immediately tried to match the the same angle as the guy wire and just put the stick in my lap seven and a half G's and just try to get after it well I missed it with my nose I missed the wire with my nose is how close it was uh, but my left wing still caught the wire and in doing so uh, it took out probably a two by two chunk out of my left leading edge flap. And I think what happened was the cable snapped, wrapped around, and also took a big chunk out of my trailing edge flap. Uh, so, immediately pulled the throttles to idle, leveled the wings, started climbing, cleaned out my drawers, uh, you know, told the flight leader that I was heading home. And uh, you know, this is a testament to the, the FA-18. I was missing a, a pretty good chunk of my wing and airplane flew great. It's the flight control computers kind of figured out, hey, there's extra drag here, put in the right inputs. And other than sort of a loud buzzing sound that I could hear from the aerodynamics, um, airplane flew, flew great, uh, set up for a just precautionary arrested landing. And uh, yeah, no, no other major damage, but that was a close call. Um, you know, if I'd seen that maybe a hundredth of a second later, uh, who knows, maybe that cable would have gone right through the canopy. So it was a close one. No. But everybody, every Naval aviator, every Marine Corps aviator probably has, you know, three or four stories like that. It's, it's a dangerous business. Thankfully, you know, flying with the Blues, um, we, had, uh, we had three great safe seasons. Um, you know, it's, it's helpful when you're flying with the same six pilots every day. You, you get to know um, each other, your habits. You can tell if someone's having a good day or a bad day. Um, you know, if the team is gelling that day or not. And... Uh, you know, you're constantly communicating with each other. And because of that, I think, uh, and, and then the building block approach that we take to, you know, leading up to those really tight formations and, and tighter air shows. Um, I think that combination of that leads to, you know, a very safe history of, uh, of safety for the Blue Angels. So my military experience was, it was tremendous. I think it's one word to, to summarize it. Um, I think a lot of, like a lot of things that are hard, whether you played sports, you did something competitive, um, it's real easy to, over time, to forget the sacrifice, the close calls, uh, the lost friends, although you never forget those. Um, and you really just remember the good things. And there's so many good things about service. I think, you know, I've met so many other veterans and with very few exceptions, regardless of what branch of service, um, what their specialty was, whether they were officer or enlisted, whether they served four years or, or 34 years, uh, everyone I've met that has served 
really loved their time. And again, you forget the bad stuff, but I think a lot of it is, is just feeling really good about doing something that's meaningful, um, being part of something that, that's bigger than yourself, um, operating in, in a very close-knit team environment, and in doing so, really creating some of the greatest friendships that you'll ever have in your life. Um, just yesterday, I was texting with old you know, squadron mates and air wing buddies to let them know that I was doing this and, and asking them, you know, told them what the bureau number was. And I probably have six or seven texts already from old wingmen from 15 or 20 years ago, um, chiming in, giving me a hard time, telling me not to screw it up. So, you know, those friendships are, are really, they're the greatest friends. And I, I know that if I ever need something, uh, I've got a lot of friends, but I know that if I call my military buddies, uh, they'll drop everything and they'll be there for you. So the friendships, being part of a really important mission. Um, and then lastly, and selfishly, you know, I got to fulfill a childhood dream. Uh, I saw the Blue Angels when I was 14 or 15 years old, and I decided that's what I want to do. I didn't think I'd ever become a Blue Angel, but I wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot. And, uh, you know, most days walking out to, whether it was a gray jet or a blue jet, walking out to that airplane and knowing that I was going to get to climb into it, and take you know 30 or 40 million dollars of taxpayer assets and go out and light my hair on fire that was awesome um, and then you know the blue angels were the icing on the cake uh, didn't think that would ever happen and uh, things just lined up and and it was it was something else it was the ride of a lifetime